Hi, this is Peter Erskine, and you are listening to Radio Richard. Radio Richard! Grammy and multi-award winning drummer and composer Peter Erskine is widely regarded as one of the world's finest musicians and educators. His 50 albums as leader are joined by playing in the iconic bands of Stan Kenton, Maynard Ferguson, Weather Report, Steps Ahead, Joni Mitchell, Steely Dan, Diana Krall, both Brecker brothers, Gary Burton and Pat Metheny, and John Schofield. But you know, that's enough about him. Let's actually listen to Peter Erskine. Let's listen to this, uh, to this uh, intro. Yeah. Okay. Right. So um, when we when we first started running it, um, you know, uh, Mike counted it off: one, two, three. <laughs> So, you know, I'm, I wasn't quite big banding it, but I'm catching the hits and I'm playing a backbeat. And Mike said, can you do something else? That's boring. Now, I knew that he had just seen uh, King Crimson. They had played a concert on one of the one of the piers in, uh, on, on the west side of Manhattan. And he had been raving about Bill Bruford's use of the Simmons drum set. Right. And I, and I knew that Bruford, uh, you know, particularly with King Crimson, was, was into... Uh, this kind of uh, uh, yep, which is you know a a, a pattern of five. It, it, it's it's all in four four, but you have this combination of twos and threes in the accent scheme. Right. So one two one two three one two one two three one two. And you know Tony did this with Miles um, way back when, and and I was a big Don Ellis fan. Anyway, the the idea almost seemed like. Uh, obvious to me and i thought well this is maybe a little heavy-handed but i'll try this so you know one two and then uh you know michael dug it and that became part of the tune uh, and but then you and, the pattern you played there on the recording it sounded like it was a little bit more a bit more rocky the, the accents on the snare yeah yeah and we liked that approach and we and we tracked that it was interesting um it was just mike minieri on on a on a moog keyboard i forget the the, the model but it was the right. one in the early 80s they'd come out mm -hmm. with a polyphonic keyboard um and mike brecker on tenor and myself on drums so eddie gomez wasn't there that night and warren bernhardt was not there uh but bruce lundvall uh, who was the head of the record label, uh, was there. So he was kind of our audience, and, and uh, he wanted to hear, you know, what, what, was, what was the band up to in the studio. So we cut it, and then uh, the, the piece required a fair amount of, of overdubbing because we had to add the bass, we added Warren Burns. Sure. Uh, and, and, and then as part of the overdubbing, uh, I'm pretty sure I, uh, I must have done some kind of... Uh, uh... Right. Nice. Something like that. Uh, now, you know, we were recording onto tape. Right. Um, so there was no fixing uh, in the uh, in the Pro Tools sense. In the, no, in the no. World. Uh, and, and it makes you marvel when you listen to a lot. I'm, I'm not talking about our, our recordings, but when I listen to a lot of the 
the the incredible pop stuff. Uh, I was doing a film date uh, at Warner Brothers uh, on the Warner Brothers stage, and um, whatever approach I had taken on 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 the queue, uh, hey Peter, we don't like what you're doing. Can you come up with something else? Uh, you know, and and when you have an 80 piece orchestra sitting out there. Uh, you realize, well, I've pretty much got one chance uh, <laughs> here. Uh, and luckily, the alternative uh, whatever uh, seemed to work. Um, the input of, of a rhythm section really can determine, uh, uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, if we're, if, we're, uh, if we're being watched or listened to by any writers or producers out there, they can often get the best out of the musicians they're working with by, you know, inviting some of their creative input. And it's a problem when when you when you demo stuff or you build it, uh, you know, you can get married to the temp tracks that you've put together. And sure. Somebody doesn't play it. You know, I, I've I've gone into some sessions where they want me to replicate uh, stuff that's been programmed, and I. Some of that stuff is not possible, at least for me. Right. With just two hands and two feet. But on the other hand, I, as a writer, um, as I say, my approach has always been that I, being a composer and being an arranger for, you know, 45 years, I, I write stuff out. But at the same time, I also invite, when I have a brilliant player, you know, like yourself, I, I say, okay, here's what I've written. I know it's playable because, you know, I, I studied Pete Erskine's playing, so I know it's playable, but <laughs> if you have a better idea, great. You know, so I think there's a balance between those two things. Hey, I, I once had a student who came up to me and said, uh, you know, I'm, it took me a while, but I finally, finally figured it out. And, uh, here's what you played on, on such and such an album. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the, the part he was playing for me was a combination of, of two drum sets that I'd overdubbed. Ah. And he managed to do it all at once. And I just went, that's mm -hmm. pretty good. That's pretty good. Keep working on it. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, you know, that we, a lot of times we, we don't know these things. And uh, I, I once uh, did a session with Ricky Lawson and I, I wrote out one of his famous grooves, you know, on one of the records that I heard. And he said, you do know that, the, that, that I did that with two drum kits. And I said, I have no idea. He says, but I'll, but I'll, but I'm going to overdub it for you just the same way I did when I was doing it with the yellow jackets. So, you know, that was uh, introduction for me to uh, a whole world of uh, secrets of, of records that we love. Now the, uh, the, the guy who didn't, uh, need to overdub, uh, and it was so much fun to see in your in your uh, excellent video was uh, Charlie Smith, who uh, is seen playing the drums with uh, Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker, uh, that uh, version of Hot House on television. Yes, yes, yes. That that was a lot of fun to uh, to see that. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, now, here's an interesting uh, thing. Uh, the, the the gentleman who who called me uh, is Joel McNeely who uh, does a lot of uh, film and television, uh, as well as writing work uh, mm. specifically for Seth MacFarlane. And uh, this wasn't a, a film or a television score. This was an album. And uh, we've done a few for Seth. Uh, and, uh, you know, Seth uh, wanted to record a capital and do it to, like, the way they used to do it in the old days. So Indeed. we had the drums out in the main room along with everyone else. And uh, on the first rundown of one of the songs, uh, you know, I'm playing, doing all the fills, setting up all the figures, doing the, the things that big band drummers habitually uh, do. Mm. And uh, when I heard the playback, uh, I instantly realized, ooh, now I know why great drummers like Alvin Stoller, Irv Kotler, uh, 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 Jack Sperling, uh, uh, right. Shelley, uh, Mel Lewis, uh, 
why they made the choices they did because it's not just the drum mics hearing the drums. It's the saxophone mics. It's the trombone mics. It's the trumpet mics. So I quickly had to make a, a course correction. Now, uh, everything's going great. We're in the uh, we're in we're in Capitol Studio A, and and they even opened it up. They put the strings in B. Some of the stuff was like expanded big band with a small orchestra. And we're running down this chart on the third day, and uh, by this point uh, in the project, I've gotten used to seeing that the, the, a lot of the, the drum part stuff had been generated from the you know the music notation program, which right. also functioned as a demo. Uh, so I'm just playing uh, quarter notes, you know, on the on the ride symbol. Yeah. Whereas with my left hand, I'm just writing on the on on the music. I'm circling every place that I want to <laughs> look at the look at the lead trumpet part. Right. Because I know it's the first take. We're not going to use it. Mm -hmm. So then we all go in to listen, and uh, it's really swinging. Uh, and in and, and great part because I think the drums aren't doing too much. Uh, we we proceed to to record it a couple more times. We craft it. We shape it. We build it. We get the perfect take. All right? And listening back and everyone's high-fiving, like, wow, this is great. And I turned to the bassist, Chuck Berghofer, who was halfway across the room, and I made a face like, yeah. and he went, what, man? I said, it doesn't swing as much as the first time we ran it down. Hmm. And he and he goes, you know what? You're right. I said, okay. So uh, Joel McNeely uh, was gracious enough uh, at the beginning of the project because, you, you know, Joel uh, was a jazzer way back when, but he's been doing the, the orchestral film thing. I thought he was being modest, but he said, if anything at all smells funny or doesn't seem right in the jazz scheme of things, I really want you to speak up. Right. I said, okay. So for the first time, I, I, you know, I say, hey, Joel, do you think we could do it one more time? He goes, oh, sure. Why? I said, I, I, we can get it to swing more. It's, it's a rhythm section thing. It's me. Uh, he said, yeah, I'll ask Seth. And Seth's having so much fun singing this stuff. So he goes, sure. Uh, now, the trumpet players weren't happy. Uh, mm. And I, t I try not to make trumpet players unhappy. No, but it's difficult to not make them unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to be a trumpet player uh, mm. when I was a kid. Uh, and, and I love the instrument. And I love the, uh, I love the players here. Sure. Uh, so anyway, let me, go to, uh, let me go to this track. I, I want to demonstrate something for you. This is so much okay. fun. This is the Joel McNeely arrangement. She said nine o'clock. She said nine o'clock. Can I just keep breathing till nine o'clock? Little heart, will you please hold together? Till she's here, standing near again. Then at nine o'clock, we may see a sight like the world's first rainbow to glow at night. And if we get a kiss just then, we'll see miracles. From nine to ten Okay, now check this out. An eight-bar shout chorus is coming up, and I hit the snare drum one time. Okay. That's why it swings. Now, where did I get this idea from, aside from the revelation, like, hmm, okay, 
the uh, the Miles recording Miles Ahead, uh, which has Art Taylor playing drums. It's all the Gil Evans writing, you know. Boop, you know, Springsville, that that Johnny Carisi tune. Now I've heard some some bands, you know, recreate or reproduce that, uh, and the drummer uh, sometimes will make the bad choice to catch all the hits. Yes. And it, it just sounds wrong. Uh, you know, especially, <laughs> I mean, imagine that, but if you have, your Bernie Glow is, is playing lead, you don't need to catch those figures. And so the secret to playing uh, any of that Gill music, particularly from the Miles Ahead album, is not to, not to cut the figures. And drummers from the time they're in you know, high school, basically, High school band directors are, are always, you know, bow, ba -ba 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 -ba. sure, sure, sure. You know, they want them to, to catch all that stuff. You know, I first learned it, Richard, uh, uh, a writer named Gene Rowland, who uh, uh, was long associated with the Stan Kenton band. Hmm. We, uh, we were rehearsing, reading through a lot of music, and Gene was writing stuff. Uh, Stan wanted uh, something like, you know, what the kids are listening to. So he was dipping his toes in the, you know, some more contemporary backbeat oriented stuff. I'm being the dutiful, well-behaved, uh, I didn't say beautiful, I said dutiful. Yeah, dutiful, yes, got it. Uh, uh, big band drummer, and I'm doing the setups, and I'm catching the hits, and I you know, thought I'd done a good job. I am reading very well. Uh, at the end of the rehearsal, Gene's collecting the music, and the only other person in the room is me. I'm packing up the drums. And he walked over to, to me, and he goes, hey, man, he goes, you know, I got 15 other guys playing these rhythms. I don't need you to play them too. Right. I was, you know, I was approaching it more like a circus drummer. Right, uh, right. To his right. ears. Uh, and I wasn't sophisticated enough yet to qu quite get that. Uh, and so it was really working with, with uh, uh, Seth McFarlane and Joel McNeely and also getting a chance uh, several times, uh, you know, to play the... Uh, uh, the Gil Evans music that he'd written for Miles. Yeah. In that case, you know, we, we, we normally have Wayne Bergeron playing lead trumpet. And right. when, when Wayne's there, you know, he he's you don't need to keep hitting the nail on the head. So no, no, no. Radio Dum Dum Radio. Oh, is that Richard Niles? Radio Richard, Radio, Radio Richard. Radio, radio Richard! Yeah. I'm going to shut off my voice mic, and I'm going to play uh, this tune called uh, Home Basie. It was Bob Mincer's impression of uh, the Basie band having a little bit of a backbeat to it. Great. A one, two, a one, two.
Yes, indeed. <laughs> Fabulous. Oh, thank you. That was fun. I'm that super was... grateful uh, to you for, for making the time to do this, and so great to have you play for the show, and, and can't thank you enough. Well, thank you, Richard. I'm a fan, and I really appreciate that you invited me on. Um, and uh, if you want to talk about uh, uh, old drum sets, we should do that. Okay, definitely, man. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Okay. Radio Richard. Like, share, subscribe, even donate. Radio Richard. Be informed. Be amazed. Be inspired.